Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good? Tim, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you, and uh, thanks to everyone at the Internet Education Foundation for all the work that you're doing uh, to bring the key voices together on Internet policy. Tim said I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, which I did. I hate to date myself, but at the time I grew up in the Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley was cherry orchards. So I've seen a lot of uh, uh, evolution in my day. I'm sure most of you are way too young to ever have heard of fortune systems, but that was the first computer I ever used, so uh, way before Apple. So it's, uh, it's great to be here and great to be in this job. And I just want to say good morning to everyone. Uh, this is a really important conference, uh, I know, for all of you and for us at the Department of Commerce. I want to thank all of you in your, this room for your efforts to ensure that the Internet continues to drive commerce and to create jobs throughout the United States. In particular, I want to thank the Congressional Internet Caucus and its co-chairs, Senator Thune and Leahy, as well as Congressman Eshoo and Congressman Goodlatte. Um, their tremendous leadership on Internet policy has never been more important and more valued. Um, a few months ago, we launched the Commerce Department's new priorities at a local incubator here in Washington, D.C. called 1776. I'm sure many of you have experienced the, inter the energy and excitement at that innovation hub here in this city. That incubator and many others across the country grew out of the President's Startup of America initiative, which is now celebrating its third anniversary um, just this week. Throughout the country, entrepreneurs are launching web-based startups at these unique hubs. As a result, truly revolutionary ideas are finding their way into the market. Internet companies are gaining traction in tandem with the overall growth in our country. You know, with 10 straight quarters of GDP growth, all-time record exports, and 8.2 million jobs created over the last four years. So looking back, I've spent 27 years in the private sector. I started five companies myself. Uh, but the internet heavily influenced uh, how we operated. I'll just give you two examples. Uh, one firm that we had in the real estate development business, our team was able to do, you know, once the products were developed, initial site visits virtually uh, rather than having to travel. We were able to do them virtually instead of in person. And that saved us enormous amount of time and uh, expense. I was also executive chairman of a company called TransUnion. Uh, we marketed many of the services that we had over uh, the net and over the web, and that was really uh, a highly effective program for us. So now, as secretary, I get to see firsthand how the digital economy is becoming an integral factor in so many sectors of the private sector and allowing those sectors to innovate and create jobs. For example, like many of you, I was just at CES in Las Vegas, and I walked the floor and saw how the Internet is serving as a dynamic platform for powerful devices ranging from smartphones to thermostats to Fitbits to cars and so much more. Um, the facts are compelling. Today, six million Americans work in technology and innovation fields. Uh, more than half a million jobs have been created by apps since the uh, uh, iPhone was created in 2007. And just yesterday, the Commerce Department released new data that shows that more than $357 billion in services exports were digitally deliverable in 2011, which represents more than 60% of our total services exports. All of these facts lead to an obvious conclusion. Policies that support the growth of America's digital economy are critical to the growth of America's overall economy. And that statement has deep implications for how the federal government should partner more closely with leaders like you. The good news is that our president and the people in this administration get it. And at the Commerce Department, for example, our new Open for Business agenda includes priorities such as driving innovation and unlocking more federal data. 
both of which are closely tied to the digital economy. Also, we have a number of talented people at the department who make up our innovation team. They are proactively working to support e-commerce and smart internet policies. These people include Pat Gallagher, who's my number two, my deputy, who also serves as the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Larry Strickling, who I think is here today, uh, who leads our National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Michelle Lee, the acting head of our Patent and Trademark Office, who came to us from Google. Uh, Kendall Berman, who's our Deputy General Counsel, formerly of the Center of Democracy and Technology. Ted Dean, our Deputy Assistant Secretary of ITA, who leads our efforts uh, regarding the safe harbor. Jim Hawk, who's here, uh, my Director of Public Affairs, who came from 463 Communications. And my policy advisors on all things internet and innovation, Andy Grotto and Josh Mandel. And there are others as well. This team has worked with many of you for years, and we look forward to that continued collaboration. Partnership is absolutely critical for us and for us to be successful on your behalf. Given our renewed focus on supporting the work that you do, I thought this would be a good moment to reintroduce the Commerce Department to this community. Many of you know bits and pieces about what our bureaus do. But when we put it all together, we get a clear picture of a department that is broadly committed to supporting the right internet policies and resources and to help entrepreneurs and businesses, as well as civil society leaders and other stakeholders. At the most basic level, the Commerce Department helps provide strong infrastructure for the digital uh, economy to operate and grow. This is best no shown in NTIA's work on broadband and spectrum. With $4 billion from the Recovery Act, NTIA helped lay broadband in communities across the country. This is bringing opportunities for entrepreneurs and others to tap into high-speed internet where it simply did not exist before, in places ranging from inner cities to rural Native American communities. I'm pleased to say that we recently hit a major milestone, 100,000 miles of broadband laid since 2009. And I should note that these projects have connected or upgraded around 10% of America's schools and libraries, an important down payment on the President's recent pledge. So congratulations to Larry Strickling who led that effort. NTIA also takes the lead on spectrum management. The president's goal is to free up 500 megahertz of federal and non-federal spectrum for wireless broadband by 2020. NTIA has made significant progress uh, in taking the first step, identifying the spectrum for release. So far, NTIA has identified more than 400 megahertz for this purpose. We're working now closely with the FCC, the Defense Department, and other agencies to meet the goal of actually freeing up that spectrum. In addition, NTIA also brings together stakeholders to form consensus on emerging issues. For example, last year, the President and asked NTIA to hear from leaders like you about consumer privacy issues. We began that discussion uh, by focusing on privacy disclosures for mobile apps. NTIA brought together 300 key stakeholders on this issue. So together, they developed a voluntary code of conduct for app developers. Ultimately, this code of conduct will enhance privacy notices on apps, helping consumers make better decisions about which apps to download and use. This year, NTIA is taking the same approach to tackle a second area, facial recognition technology. If you are interested in privacy issues surrounding that technology, please make sure that we are aware of your ideas. As well, my team is engaged in the recently announced presidential review 
of big data and privacy that is being led by John Podesta. This process will help all of us understand how to promote the free flow of information while also supporting privacy and security. NTIA's highly collaborative approach is the same approach that's being used by a second Commerce Department Bureau, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. As you might know, NIST worked with industry to develop a framework to protect the cybersecurity of America's critical infrastructure, including companies that support our nation's water and energy needs. NIST held meetings in five cities across the country, each of which were attended by hundreds of leaders in industry, government, and other stakeholders. We also received hundreds of written comments. Over the past year, we published several drafts of this framework, the most recent of which was posted online. The final framework is due out in a few weeks, and I am confident that we will deliver a framework that is flexible, scalable, and cost-effective for industry. A third Commerce Department Bureau that is actively partnering with the tech community is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Part of our mission is to protect the creative ideas that form the backbone of business and our digital economy a huge challenge in this information age that we live in. These efforts are particularly important for content creators. In fact, a few months ago, the Commerce Department calculated the impact of arts and culture for the very first time. We announced that this creative industry contributes more than $500 billion to our annual GDP. Obviously, it is crucial that we support songwriters, artists, and others who depend on strong intellectual property protections for their livelihood. For that reason, we recently conducted the most comprehensive analysis of digital copyright policy in nearly 20 years. Flowing from that analysis, our Patent and Trademark Office and NTIA want to partner with you to develop smarter copyright policies for the 21st century. Our first effort is to improve the process for removing online content that infringes on intellectual property rights, the notice and takedown system. To be successful, we will need leaders from this community, your community, at this table, including internet service providers, consumer groups, copyright holders, and other creators to participate. I'm pleased to say that we will launch this new forum here in Washington, D.C. in March, so stay tuned for more details. Let me just close by noting that as some who, someone who grew up in the heart of the Silicon Valley, I understand how vital our digital economy is to our economic growth. I commit to you today that the Commerce Department will serve as the chief federal champion for good Internet policy that supports America's entrepreneurs, businesses, workers, and the consumers who go online to buy their products. That means, in addition to the work of our bureaus, the department will continue to take seriously our role as the voice for business and innovation in the administration policy discussions, ranging from surveillance and disclosures to big data and privacy and much more. But let me be clear. On all of these issues, we need your partnership every single day because the policy landscape shifts quickly as new technologies and ideas in this space continue to emerge and evolve. Together, we must be nimble and we must constantly adapt to stay ahead of the curve. I rely on our commerce team to have a strong finger on the pulse of what leaders like you are thinking. The fact is, we need constant input from businesses, policymakers, civil society leaders, and others. I believe it is critically important that our team understands all of the points of views on these issues, even when groups and companies within the community take different positions. If we continue to walk arm in arm, we can ensure that Washington takes actions that help, not hurt, 
this community's ability to create jobs, while also fostering a free and open internet in the United States and throughout the world. I will close with an excerpt from the statement by Pope Francis, who has three and a half million Twitter followers. Yes, I am jealous. Just recently, in a long piece discussing the merits and pitfalls of communications technology to society, he wrote this, and I quote, the networks of human communication have made unprecedented advances. The internet, in particular, offers immense possibilities for encounter and solidarity. This is something, I tr this is something truly good. And I could not agree more. And I'm pleased to be in a room full of leaders who understand that good internet policy can turn revolutionary technologies into revolutionary benefits for our society. As partners, let's do all we can to develop, implement, and protect the internet's potential to improve the lives of our fellow Americans. And I commit to you that the Commerce Department and the administration will continue to work day and night to ensure that the state of America's net remains strong, vibrant, and an engine for economic growth and job creation. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, Madam Secretary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Carl Zabo with NetChoice. Uh, you were talking about the NTIA multi-stakeholder process on privacy, and, and one of the things that you mentioned was that the goal of the process is to help consumers make better decisions. But with 300 different people in the room, each of whom think that they know what's best for consumers, isn't it more important to give consumers information and let them be the ones to make the decisions? That's exactly the point. The point is, is that if there's greater awareness and greater understanding of what out there, then I think consumers will make good decisions for themselves. I mean, you know, I think that uh, when you think about uh, the privacy issues, they're very complicated, right? And, uh, so, you know, the thing that the president and I are committed to is, uh, you know, both protecting, uh, you know, privacy as well as protecting the internet freedom, as well as taking into account uh, national security, and this is, you know, a complicated mix to try and find the right solution for. But we under, and that's why he's called for a real, you know, conversation to figure out with you in this room, you know, what's what's the right path we should be taking. Madam Secretary. Hmm? I'm Madam Secretary. I'm Adam Spencer with Newsbeat Social. I was wondering what sort of uh, solutions you would offer to companies in Silicon Valley that are complaining that. Uh, users abroad are dropping their products because of security and uh, NSA ac uh, access to it or government access to their programs in the back door? Well, I think the president, um, you know, in his speech about 10 days ago, talked about, you know, important principles that we use in, uh, in this country. And through the review that went on, uh, what we came out with was some very, you know, things that I think are were obvious but weren't well known. I mean, we don't use surveillance to benefit United States companies. And we use surveillance to protect Americans and our national security. And so I think that some of those principles had been perhaps unclear or muddied, and he was very clear in coming out with where we are on that. And I think that that will help, and I've been talking with uh, uh, various uh, leaders in other parts of the world about how do we, for example, what do we do about the EU safe harbor, which is a very important uh, 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 construct that exists uh, that allows both European and American companies to do business with each other. And so, you know, figuring out how we move forward in a very complex environment where you're, as I said, what we're trying to do is protect you know, uh, our national security and at the same time take into account people's privacy as well as trying to keep the internet free, right? Those are the balance things that we have to balance. So I would say that, you know, to folks that are concerned, I think the president was quite clear in his speech and 
he uh, released, uh, you know, a presidential memorandum. So that, you know, be trying to be very transparent about what are the principles that guide uh, this country. Uh, Madam Secretary, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Hi, Jim Barnett with AARP. We're also a supporter of NSTIC, and we're hoping you talk a bit about, about initiatives like NSTIC and how the public sector and the private sector can work together to enhance privacy and security through groups like IDSG. Well, I, you know, as I said, I think that what, what, we're, what uh, uh, the president has uh, initiated through um, the work of John Podesta, he's going to lead, he's leading a group to which my team and I will be a part in terms of the privacy conversation that will go on over the next 90 days. And the goal of that is to um, help inform uh, the president as to what are the issues that we should be considering. It's not to actually come up with solutions, but more to come up with an, a work plan and an agenda and a report. Uh, but to do that, we have to have uh, dialogues and a lot of multi-stakeholder input into the issue of privacy and w what should, you know, are there policy implications? Are there legislative implications or not? You know, there isn't a preconceived notion there, but I think out of this dialogue that has emerged uh, regarding uh, national security, privacy, et cetera, I think there's more conversation that needs to occur around consumer privacy. Well, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much.